LLMs are just autocomplete on steroids. That's it. They are mm-hmm. trained on internet scale and text sets to work out, given a set of inputs, what is the next most likely input. Hi, everyone. I'm Cami Chaos. And I am Rick Terosi. And as you may know, we are mildly interesting people, which is why we work very hard to find you wildly interesting people to meet every single week. Sometimes we've had those wildly interesting people as part of our lives for decades and decades, and now we're finally getting to introduce you to them. Cami, who is our guest this week? I'm so excited. Um, Before I go into who our guest is this week, I want to mention that while we're not really doing seasons, we're kind of doing seasons. And we have chosen this particular guest to round out our first season of Mildly Interesting People. Uh, This particular individual has been a permanent fixture in my life since I was 19, I believe. 18. (laughs) <laughs> okay, 18. Since I was 18, I have known him my entire adult life. Um, I have gotten into more trouble and been saved from more trouble by this man than anyone else in my entire life. And if you have one of those people that you can go five years without speaking to and then talk to like you just saw them yesterday, uh, he's my person for that. Aside from all the personal gushy stuff, he's also like the technology badass that they call when things are just not okay. He is the, uh, he is the technology fixer, the online fixer extraordinaire. And he has had a varied and spectacular career, which we're probably not going to talk a lot about, but I would like to introduce you to one of my favorite humans on the entire planet. It, if there were humans throughout the galaxy, he would still be in my top three. <laughs> Everyone, I am so honored to introduce to you my friend Martin Kelly. Hi, that's the best intro. I think you like me more than my cat likes me. And my cat, she's over there, just kind of mad at me today, but she likes me a lot. That's so sweet. I, um, but yeah, I don't I want to don't compete with have, your cat, but it is possible I love you more than your cat loves you. I do love you very much. Yeah, I, I think there's a reason you're in the running for sure. <laughs> oh, Violet. <laughs> She's mad at me today. Why is your cat mad we at me today? We haven't had our daily ration. So usually, aside from her sleeping on my feet, we need at least four hours of nap cuddles during the course mm. of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, and like the post breakfast nap cuddle, the post lunch nap cuddle, the middle of the afternoon, and then kind of a free floating nap cuddle where she comes <laughs> and yells at me until I lie down and she sleeps on my knees. Um, and we only had the morning one today because it's been kind of busy. So, um, to this, I'm just going to go down and basically lie prone and be cat furniture for a good four hours straight, make up for occasionally just like throw a kibble at her, like feed her like grapes, except yeah. it's, you know, ground up chicken bits, yeah. palm frond. Well, you're, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just make, just apologies. Do you have churros in Germany? Do you know the churro? Uh, yes, we do. I have churros in the house. Okay. Nice. That's but how she's, I. She's, yeah, how you make up for, I make up for, so she has, she's an old cat. I got her as an adult rescue. She's 11 now and she has, as cats often do, early chronic uh, kidney disease, early kidney insufficiency. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, her favorite food is like a sardine and mackerel food from England. Uh-huh. And so I, she can't have it because it's terrible for her, but I squeeze all of the liquid out of it and then mix it with her kidney food in the little blender to make like um, <laughs> roll your own churros. And yeah, she mm-hmm. loves that stuff. Yes. Um, uh, also, so we're all, she's dumb, we're, so she doesn't know any better. <laughs> yeah, we're on a call right now with someone who is as uh, kind and and spoiling to his cat as I am to mine. So, again, if I didn't already love you, I'm just drawing little hearts. On my... I, so I've loved your cats. Um, as, as, like the minute I met them, they were awesome. But I didn't realize I was a cat person until quite recently. Yeah. Like, I always had dogs. I've got paintings of the family dogs around the house. Mm-hmm. And by exes. Why do my exes paint my dogs? I don't know. Um, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Got this, I'll, I'll, I'll grab one and show you it later. Like, it's, yes, it's kind of amazing. Um, but this cat 
was an ex's cat and she got it but couldn't take care of it. So when we split up, I ta-da, absolutely take the cat. And it turns out that I, I was, I, I do love dogs still, but I kind of, I was kind of tricked by big dog into thinking that dogs were the only choice. Um, but yeah, cats, you have to work for uh, a cat's. Like it's an ongoing relationship, and you're both putting things into it, and it's and it's you know it's much more rewarding when you work at it and you get a reward, and um, and even if that reward is just not having my skin ripped from my hands when I pet her, <laughs> it still feels like a reward. Like look, almost no scars these days. I'm doing pretty. Oh well. my gosh, you're doing so well. You must not have left her alone for very long. Well, um, my. Mother had to look after for four days recently and went home with, you know, like, I, when I was explaining to her, like, here's, here's the food, here's the drink, here's the wound disinfectant and the plastic spray skin. And she's like, what's that for? Me? No, find out. <laughs> she's a rescue. She's wild. What are you going to do? Um, I forgot what we we even started. We were just doing the intro at this point. Right? We were just doing <laughs> intros. It's cool. But I do want to say... In the long history of Martin being one of my favorite humans, um, when my child was born, the first place that we ever visited with her was Martin's home. He was living in a church basement, renting out this beautiful apartment in a church basement, and your mom was in town. Yeah. And wanted to meet the baby. My mom, the gangster. His mom, the gangster, needed to meet the baby. So the first visit that my daughter ever went on was to visit Martin and his mom in a church basement. I'm sure, that's yeah. not terribly interesting to all of you, but super heartfelt for me. And I feel like well, we, Rick is going to have yeah, a lot of no, that to do this week. <laughs> I was talking to I was talking to my mom about this earlier on, and we talk, and yeah, and she asked about your kid, um, and uh, I and I think it's either she remembers her very fondly, or for some reason she owes her money. I'm not sure what. <laughs> it's possible. My mom is, she's a little tiny, like five foot nothing Arabic woman who um, has henchmen. <laughs> and she once called me from Afghanistan to tell me she was, she'd been picked up at the airport and she was, dri- she was driving to her, her supplier. So she, she's like, when I say supplier, it's not drugs. Like this is like textile. <laughs> Leather. Leather. Um, oh. And she was being, she told me she had like a truckload of people with AK-47s behind her. And I'm like, oh my God, she said, no, no, those are the bodyguards that my client laid on for. I'm like, you know, that story sounds almost believable. <laughs> but you know, she has, she has henchmen. I think my mom's secretly a, a crown lord. Hmm. So anyway. you, you, you two have more in common than you even know. Yeah. Just, just Wait, saying. Yeah. Are you from a crime family as well, Rick? Uh, my father may have been involved in some unscrupulous activities for <laughs> quite some period of time. Yes. You know, given, given our age and therefore given the ages of our parents and our grandparents and mm. given the fact that the economy wasn't super regular for large parts of the century that they were adults in, that's, I, mm-hmm. I found out my step grandfather, um, uh, Francesco Carnavali, um, was he was a, a terrazzo layer in England? He, he laid little tiny tiny tiles out of animal and stuff. But the reason he was in England was um, because he had to flee Italy because the law were after him because his cigarette smuggling operation had been run. <laughs> he, was, he was a large scale cigarette smuggler at the age of fourteen, so he, he was fleeing just it. Nice. My family is so boring comparatively. I want to. Go ahead. I feel like we're going to talk about personal stuff the entire time, which is great and fantastic and good. But there is a topic in particular that you were interested in talking about that I am very interested in hearing about. And I don't want to just say, hey, let's talk about AI. I want to talk about why you think our current AI technology is just autocomplete on steroids. Okay. So, yeah. Um, So we can talk a little bit about what I do for a living in general terms. So I'm a consultant for other consultants, um, and they come in and um, do ask me for two kinds of things, like, here, explain something for me, or, hey, everything's gone horribly wrong, how do we fix it? And the two things are quite often related, because another joke about it is, like, I, I'm a NAS, I provide no as a service. Somebody comes along and says, should we do this? I'm like, oh, <laughs> fuck no. 
don't do that. Here's why you will die horribly if you do this. And those things, as I get older, are just converging, converging. And, and the latest one is, you know, what everybody else is calling, like ChatGPT, Lambda, Bard, all, all of these um, large language models, which they're calling um, AI, and which I um, insist in a, a very strong way, absolutely not AI, because there's no intelligence there. Um, intelligence, by any meaningful definition, includes um, uh, the development of um, skills and processes and the knowledge to apply them, like an awareness of what's going on. And that is something that is completely absent from LLMs because LLMs are just autocomplete on steroids. That's it. They are mm-hmm. trained on internet scale and text sets to work out, given a set of inputs, what is the next most likely input? So they will read, you know, 400 um, results of a, a bar exam. And so that they will know that if you give them a, given a set of questions and a question is part of the sequence of text that they're following, um, they will be able to do a very, very good impersonation of a human producing a v- variant of that text to the point where they can pass the bar exam. But they're not a lawyer, which is proved by the fact that somebody tried to use them as a lawyer and is now getting, I believe they're going to go to jail. Like the judge is extremely unimpressed with this whole um, using um, chat GPT to write briefs thing. Um, people talk about how the risk is that they hallucinate facts. I take exception to that as well because they don't have a concept of a fact because they don't have any concepts. They, if, if they hallucinate facts, they also hallucinate um, the things they get correct as well because everything is just, you know, it's over par. And just sometimes it's accidentally truthful. And the other times it's accidentally not truthful, but there's no qualitative difference between the two. And if you're interacting with one and you challenge one on the solution, 50 50, they'll just double down. Like if you're talking to them about yourself and it tells you that you were a, a, a criminal or a very famous author of a paper and you say, absolutely not, that's not the case, they will say, no, it's happening. You must be wrong. I don't know why you're lying to me. I don't think we can talk about this anymore. It's violating my ethical programming. Like, you have no ethical programming. You know, they are cool things. Like as, as a piece of technology, are very cool. We've got great at using distributed computing systems to um, create models that we train on extremely large amounts of data and handling large amounts of data. The discipline in itself, and I'm very impressed with it. But what I worry about is if you look at like the Google search results for hey, – here's a good one. Look at the Google search results for NFTs going down over the last mm-hmm. four yep. to five months as all of the people who were pitching NFTs now pivot to – pitching AI solutions, which are non-solutions to problems that you don't have. Mm-hmm. Um, it means that I don't have to hear about Bitcoin nearly so much anymore, <laughs> which is a win. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. Um, um, and, I, and I miss, I mean, we're in, the, we're in the Bitcoin phase where everybody's just going to jail anyway, so it was going to come to a natural end. I think yeah. Binance are the latest ones. Oh, no, Coinbase mm-hmm. got um, an SEC investigation open against them this week as well. Fun. And um, so right now, a lot of people at work are asking me the questions that their clients are asking them. Like, should we consider this? Should we become expert in this? Should we replace some of our copywriters with this? Should we replace it for our internal knowledge base? And the answer to all of those questions is a resounding no for fairly self-evident reasons. Like, if you're going to be selling your services, when you tell people lies based on your internal knowledge base, having told you lies about what your company does, you're going to get into legal trouble. So don't ever consider it. Um, but people are just one of the reasons it's replacing NFTs and and Coinbase, uh, Coinbase, Bitcoin, um, <laughs> or um, crypto in general is crypto was kind of hard to explain the benefits to people. Yeah. Right. Um, there's that famous sticker like, no, it can't be like this. It can't be this stupid. You must be explaining it wrong. Um, and watching any of the people from like Anderson and Horowitz trying to talk about what Web3, which is just a one attempt to rebrand crypto, trying to explain its functionality is like, how are you so dumb? And yet people pay you money. It's <laughs> marvelous. <laughs> Whereas with live language models, it's much easier to convince people of value of it because everybody can interact with it. You can just right. show it right. to them. And they go, oh, my God, this is really, really cool. And because it's, it's playing into a, a human weakness, our desire to anthropomorphize things. Like, I anthropomorphize mm-hmm. my cat. My cat doesn't hate me. My cat has no opinion. My cat has a wristwatch, and she's telling me now it's time for feeding, but she has no opinion. <laughs> when we do that with computers, there's the Google engineer 
who was utterly, utterly convinced that Lambda had achieved sentience. And then they yep. fired him because it's autocomplete and it's not sentient. And they know that. But the people that are being shown chat GPT by all the people who have pivoted from Bitcoin to AI don't know that. They were impressed by it. They're, you know, laying off their copywriters and they're having their lawyers write their briefs. I really want to see somebody go for jail for that. Like, we should get to and have a celebratory <laughs> alcohol-free cocktail the first time a lawyer goes to jail for contempt for doing that. I, I mean... Yeah, yeah. But... Yeah. Taking the, the having the minor rant out of the way, um, as I was saying earlier, like my, my currency, my stock in trade is understanding failure. And this is just exciting for me in some ways because it's an absolutely huge and epic new field of ways that people are going to fail spectacularly and explosively. I'll be able to be in three or four years' time, explain why they failed explosively, why they should have known they were mm-hmm. going to fail explosively and so on and so forth. But it's also just comedy. It's just comedy gold all the way down. Um, and Emily Bender, as I was saying, calls it a stochastic parrot, which is possibly the best turn of phrase for anything. Really, it's like parrots are brilliant. Parrots are amazing creatures. Parrots have relationship with us, um, but they don't understand what they're saying. And that's the thing about AI. It's AI comes with an understanding, not just the ability to fake understanding. We've been, oh, you familiar with the Eliza effect? I am not. Mm-mm. Yeah. So Eliza was one of the very first chatbots um, in the 60s. So you can imagine mm-hmm. how technologically sophisticated that was. And the Eliza effect is named after people's desire to believe that Eliza was alive, uh, was intelligent, because they acted. It acted like the way you would expect a human to act. So it was impossible mm-hmm. for most people to not impute intelligence to that. So this is just 60 years on. People haven't learned that lesson. Um, so we should probably run like a little, I was thinking like having a wheel behind me. I've got some nice art behind me now. Um, yeah. But I was thinking of like, like a wheel of fortune type wheel about like spin the wheel and work out possible routes from the decision we're making now to that catastrophic corporate failure. <laughs> because I, I genuinely can't think of ex- expressing to these really people who ought to know better than like the top 2% of people in their field. And I came along going, yeah, we're going to replace um, our script writers with AI. Like, really? Have you read any of that stuff? So that's, yeah, that's my big rant about, yeah, stochastic parrots, autocomplete on steroids. Like, all AI is mostly shit. I work with it daily, and it's really good at some very, very small um, I'm trying to think of like literally anything I can tell you about that wouldn't be violating. That, that's what I was no, going to ask. I was yeah. like, we, we've talked about how crappy it is. There are right. a few so, places that I use it practically. I use it practically, honestly, just when I'm writing, I'll have like, I'll have a, my brain will get stuck and I'll be like, I want to say this. Tell me how to say know, this. Yeah, when, when you, you know, know what, what you want. Well, yeah. When yeah. you know the subject matter that you are writing on kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah. when you're, you, when you want, what you want is a really good autocomplete. Having a really mm-hmm. good autocomplete is really handy. And it, it works kind of like a thesaurus as well. Um, yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like in some ways it's an okay companion editor for pros, but people have been using it for code as well. And uh, oh God, it's shockingly persuasive but also it fails review more times than human fails because it comes riddled mm-hmm. with errors or you know cop code copied straight out of something with an mit license but it obviously doesn't come and tell you that it's supposed to have an mit yeah. license so right. it's yeah. a it's a liability minefield um it, it gets you through the first pass like it helps from a code point of view it helps a junior engineer spit out code faster but that that code fails review more than if they'd done it themselves slower um, it may get better at that, but the way they train models like that, like it doesn't know what it's writing. It just says like, I've got, you train them by saying, right, here's 10 words. I'm removing this word in the middle or I'm moving the stanza in the middle. What should be there? And if it gets it right, you reinforce that in the learning model. If it gets mm-hmm. it wrong, you adjust the model. So it's got no ability to know what it did wrong because it's not no ability to know anything because it's not intelligence. Again, yeah. it's just, yep. I can, using, I use um, VS Code finally after being browbeaten to it because I can use it on my iPad because <laughs> I can't use Sublime Text on my iPad. And, and 
the, there's a little language server for almost every language we use that has more like common autocompletes. Like it knows, given this resource, what my possible arguments are. So if I type mm-hmm. the first letter, it's going down a list of 30 things and says, okay, I've seen you do this 10 times before. Every, and seven times out of those 10, you picked an EBS volume to attach. So I'm going to assume when you type E, that's what you want rather than EFS. And that's pretty good. It's just better versions of that. So if it's yes. autocomplete helping a human do stuff faster, it's got a function. If it's doing the stuff instead of a human, I think your quality control is going to lose you as much time as anything else. But do I you would love sorry go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, I, I would love to hear like do you feel like it's like qualitatively improved your pace or just made it less annoying to work? Like is it is it is it removing toil for you, Cammy? Uh it is curing the blank page syndrome. That's all it's doing for me. Okay. Uh, Which because is a when big I deal. look at it and, and nine times out of ten I use three words that it gave me. Um but I, I I suffer from blank page syndrome significantly. And oftentimes that is the one, like it's no longer a blank page and I can be pissed off because it's such shit that the, <laughs> it's such shit that the chat GPT fed out to me that I'm like, okay, I'll keep this. And oh my God, what is, and then I can, and I can use that uh, to start writing again, which is really fantastic. And gotcha. um, so, so in that way it functions yeah, kind of like the oblique process. strategies pack of deck cards. You know that yeah. one? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. yeah. See, that's, that's a useful function. I get that. Okay. So there you go. Two useful things it does. Yeah. Rick, <laughs> you had a question. Yeah. I was just going to ask, like, because throughout our careers, Martin, we've seen this happen time and time again. Do you think humanity has some need for that kind of like global irrational exuberance around a particular technology and actually to move it forward? Like pets.com was stupid in 1997, but it wasn't stupid in 2017. You know, Mm -hmm. so like, is there an, is there a need and do you, do you find more opportunity being the cynic that needs to balance that irrational exuberance for people? So, so definitely. So those things do exist. I agree that there is a need. People just get excited about um, like new transformational technology. And I think because in some ways it acts as a leveler. When a new transformational technology comes along, nobody's an expert on it. So everybody's the opportunity to get in and like, become an expert or make money quick, all these kinds of things. So um, and it's like the accelerating, like the, 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 you know, the oil rush, the steel rush, gold rushes, all these things. Like it's an entirely new field of opportunity and people will be enchanted by the thought of, you know, transforming their own personal circumstances. It's what happened mm-hmm. with, um, what was the, the Robin Hood um, uh, meme the, stocks and things like that? Yeah. And it yeah. was, you know, the for some people, it was generally transformational. Yeah. 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 Um, so I think to a degree with, with some of what we see, that's what's going on. Um, I think they fail more times than they succeed. So mm-hmm. the market is biased towards somebody like me deriving benefit from seeing how it failed and then reapplying those lessons in the future. Yeah, there, there are smaller scale waves that go through, um, like NoSQL when NoSQL first mm-hmm. came out. And it was like, oh, we're just going to yep. move our workloads into NoSQL because, because managing SQL databases at the time and also scaling them, making them highly available was really hard. So moving into NoSQL, MongoDB is much faster. And then everybody did that. And then two things happened. One, they realized they couldn't run their workloads on it. And two, they realized that the admin user was available without a password on part 27,001 and everybody got their data stolen. <laughs> Um, but this was before Bitcoin was a big deal, so nothing could happen. And now if that happened, Bitcoin's only function is in enabling technologies for crime. So it would be much more serious now. Mm-hmm. I'm willing to be challenged on that. Like I'm, I've, seen, <laughs> I've seen many people come along with ideas for using blockchain, and I've seen zero of them work. There's one place where I think it might work, and then not using it, which is just really weird. Just in blue sky, you know, um, mm. Jack Dorsey's replacement yeah. spin-off for mm-hmm. Twitter, where yep. they don't use signed domains in their posting protocol. So anybody mm. can pretend to be anybody else once it's in distributed mode. Possibly why it's not in distributed mode yet. 
why they don't hmm. want server. Um, yep. But yeah, when somebody from like some cyber crime outfit can pretend to be the, the president and it will look exactly the same. And the ideal case for that would be to have um, a blockchain based off. So it's, it's a distributed, immodifiable ledger. It's not really immutable. It, we have to, you have to have a voting attack to make it mutable. Um, and they, they didn't do it, which is weird because it's all a bunch of libertarians and crypto bros working on that stuff. I'm like, it's, mm-hmm. it was right there. It was like your use case. Why didn't you use it? You libertarians, people who know the value of, every, the value of nothing. Price of everything and <laughs> what's it on? Oh, the age of consent in every jurisdiction. Um, so, blockchain, big wave, but mostly as a neighbor of crime. Kubernetes, everybody would thought it was really, really cool. It does something, and you can just about run it, but the the cost of running it is in about 94, 95% of the use cases that I run across. It's not necessary. So it's just a way of adding uh, a couple of million to your running costs and creating your company earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, it, for, what it, for what it does, it's a very good thing for what it does. Like if you need to run the same workload. So we can't talk about what I do, but I, you can maybe get, if I say I need to run <laughs> the same banking workload in India, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, um, and in the US, needs to be the same software run everywhere. Um, Kubernetes is actually the best technology to enable that. But that is a very small subset of use cases. Um, most people um, come along and say, right, we need a, you know, a Kubernetes cluster. We're going to be doing this. I'm like, what are you doing? We're going to, we're going to run a single container, the, a single front-end application that's going to hive off Snowflake on the back end. I'm like, I mean, I can set that up for you. I, there's always, I'm always happy to have another quarter million in my bank account, but probably don't need it. So <laughs> those things, they, people do really make money when those things get traction. Mm-hmm. And those are like the lottery rooms, like somebody rolls out with a big check. So I'm like, oh yeah, this could be the next Kubernetes. And I'm, you know, I think WASM, um, WebAssembly um, is the next, being pitched as the next Kubernetes now. And about once in every 10, there will be another technology that even if it isn't any good, people will make money off it. So mm-hmm. it, it continues to provide a funnel of marks. Um, to the people who yep. are using those technological ways to... So just high-tech um, con artists is yeah. what we're... Yeah. Um, there's a, a wonderful term I learned, again, from Cory Doctor called the bezel, which is in a scam, it's the period between when uh, you've lost your money to the con artist and the con artist knows he's got your money, but you know you do not yet know that you've lost the money. So that's where we are with it. We're um, in the bezel mm. with chat GPT okay. at the moment. Um, but and you can if you look at the patterns behind it you can see the same thing happen again like all those companies are losing money hand over fist they're taking billions from microsoft or google's funding it themselves like that Mm -hmm. will not continue at some point they will have to start breaking even and taking more profit and in social networks it's through like taking all the marginal value that was assigned to the users and assigning it first to the business clients and then to the owner itself um, with ChatGPT, I think it's going to be um, a combination of cranking up the prices. Um, once you've laid off all of your copywriters, then <laughs> you have no choice but to go to OpenAI for your, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, your Amazon sales copy or whatever the heck they're using to replace it. So it'll be a combination of um, market capture um, and vendor lock in there. And I will, yep. of course, do the Nelson laugh when it happens because I'm professionally <laughs> obligated to do the Nelson laugh. And I will record myself doing the Nelson laugh in front of the, the largest group of stakeholders who've lost the most money that I can find. And I will send it on to you because I know you're Thank you. a great deal of pressure from it. I will. <laughs> but um, yes, if you're a business leader looking to replace um, human labor with um, open AI, either don't absolutely do that or do do it and then call me when you've broken and I'll come in and fix it. Either of those is cool. <laughs> um, you can find me at Potato Gun Kelly. I'm in for a second. <laughs> <laughs> potato Gun Kelly. Yeah. Uh, Rick, steer us. So there we go. I, I think that's yeah. probably enough ranting about AI technology for anybody. Yeah, and I, I, it, no, I, mean, I love that. You can talk about it as much as you want. Yeah. But. And I was, I, one of my leading indicators is how quickly folks start repositioning 
or reclassifying existing technology as this new technology. So to your point about like autocorrect, like I see a bunch of businesses that have had, you know, for lack of a better term, kind of like if then business loops running that they suddenly claim are AI because the computer is making a decision between one thing or the other based on the input. So like, that's another, that's another thing I always find compelling about these moments in time where everybody starts yeah, I mean, doing that kind we, of stuff. We saw that when um, blockchain pivoted to web three, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. all of a sudden, all of these terrible blockchain businesses, we're, we're web three businesses. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. so, Where's the web part of it and where's the three part? <laughs> we could talk a whole bunch about how Web3 wasn't a thing and also didn't need to exist. But you're right. That, that's that very specific phenomenon of a whole bunch of pre-existing, uh, kind of on the, on the downward slope of a failing scam thing suddenly finds a new thing, whether it, NFTs became a thing and then Web3 became a thing. Mm -hmm. When was the last time we heard about Web3 after chat GPT? Right. Right. We I should probably do a separate podcast where we live look at Google Trends about scams <laughs> and match them up against like the downslope of one. Like that would be a great video show just in and of itself. Mildly interesting special. Yeah, I'm, I'm down for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, a whole bunch of people will attach themselves to it. Like we include um, like ai ops or ml ops are two of the big things that happen like there's a whole bunch of machine learning ops like how to automate your machine learning work it's like a whole bunch of things like oh yeah we're ml ops um oh we are ai ops which is having an ai look at your operational signals to hmm. filter out signal from noise to reduce the number of humans now this is in like historically this has been a good trend. People have been telling me my job's been going to go away for years. All that happened was I got to manage more computers and then yell at people <laughs> who are managing computers. And ML Ops had a really good or AI Ops rather had a really good pitch that it was going to be another phase in that. But it turned out it was how much swearing do we allow on the show? A lot. Yeah. Oh god, it was cockingly awful. It was genuinely <laughs> like the sandiest bell end of the sales pitch I've ever run across in my life. Um, we, for a client, we recently evaluated a whole bunch of signal tools, um, and I made a bet on the side with some of my other colleagues that all of the ones that led with AI in their pitch would fail at the first hurdle. <laughs> and of the seven that included AI in their pitch, six failed at the first hurdle. So I was almost there. It was really mm -hmm. just like, yeah. Um, one of them was in the... They used to have an office downtown in Portland. They maybe still do. I think it was in the was it, is it the Fox Tower? That yeah, overlooked Fox. Pioneer US, Square? Yeah. Yeah, we have yeah. US Bank Tower, like where there are a lot of companies. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was like, oh, you're in Portland. It was really nice in on Zoom seeing Portland out the window. Like, you're gonna fail because I saw your pitch and it had some bad words <laughs> in, but I really want to talk to you more because I really miss Portland. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's, I a, do miss I think that's a good that's a good place where I did also want to highlight, Martin, that you are our first outside of the U.S. guest. I mean, oh, yes, you, you're the first person I'm, we've, I'm we've fully caught up on, but, but I'm an ex-Portlander, so I'm right. sort of like, yeah. yeah. But you're not from Portland, and you're not here no, now. No, I'm not. So I'm yeah. originally from the Rhubarb Triangle, which is a small I area no of Northern England. <laughs> So in the small area of Northern England, there are three towns, um, Leeds, Wakefield, and Dewsbury. You draw a triangle, those towns as the vertices. It used to be 90% of the world's cultivated rhubarb was grown in that triangle. Huh. And it's a very small triangle, like 15 miles on a side. Hmm. That's crazy. You're coming into Leeds on the train, you see all these very low... Um, this is going to sound kinkier than it is. Trust me, this is not... This is going to be very safe. Um they're called forcing sheds, where rhubarb is grown in darkness um, and harvested by candlelight, because rhubarb will grow until sunlight hits the tiny leaves on the top. And if that doesn't happen, it just keeps growing and growing. So you get very huh. long, pink, very pale pink rhubarb. It's called champagne rhubarb. And where I'm from was had the ideal soil um, hmm. for growing that kind of rhubarb. So every morning at 5 a.m. from Leeds, a, tr a special train called the Rhubarb Express in train <laughs> would leave Leeds with today's crop of forced rhubarb to mm -hmm. um, ship it to Covent Garden Market um, in London. 
so yeah, that's where I'm from. Um, most people have no reason to know about it, obviously. Oh, and um, the other thing is, there's a, a very famous nursery rhyme and a mnemonic that goes with it. Um, Richard of York gave Battle in Vain, which is the mnemonic for the spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indica, violet. And nursery rhyme was the Grand Old Duke of York. He had 10,000 men, marched them up to the top of the hill. I, I lived on that hill. That was the Battle of Wakefield. There was a castle at the top and my school was happy. So that's where I'm from. Um, I moved to Portland. Um, well, I moved to the States when I was about 19 um, to do computer geekery and moved to Texas. Um, mm-hmm. And then bounced around to a few different places before I um, visited a friend in Portland who took me to Powell's for all the books. I'm like, mm. oh, holy fuck. There's an entire city block. It's full of books. I can't um, leave now. Yeah. So I asked for vacation from my um, player um, who had foolishly um, sponsored me for a green card. Foolish, foolish. <laughs> um, and they declined to give me vacation. So I quit and got another job in Portland and just moved there. Stayed for 15 years because the people turned out to be kind of nice. The food was pretty good too. Mm-hmm. The food has gotten better. The people know, haven't gotten is, any nicer, but the food has gotten better. It's so better. upsetting because I live in Germany where everybody hates food. <laughs> <laughs> That's very upsetting. It really is. There are, like, it's better now. So I used to live in Berlin um, for about mm-hmm. five years. Now I live in um, Aachen or aix la Chapelle, which is right on the border of the Netherlands mm-hmm. and Belgium, like, like 10 minutes from the border. So I go, I go do my big shop. Um, in Belgium, a California, it's wonderful and everything tastes great. Then I bring all that back to Germany, where if you ask for the the, the spicy option in Germany, that means you get salt and pepper. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> imagine that went down real well. I mean, there, are, there are some occasional good spots. Weirdly, in Berlin, there was an incredible, like a world-class good tacos al pastor place. Oh. Um, I know. Remember that taco truck that used to be near your place um, in yeah. Southeast? Yeah. You, I got, yeah. That was my very first Al Pastor. It was like a buck. It was great. Way better than that. Turned out the two guys are from Mexico City and from their entire childhood, they hmm. wanted to be, um, I think the phrase is tromperas, you know, spit operators. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. Was there. And they got great. And they have um, like big takeover of the restaurants and cook tacos and do beer. And you know, they did a really, really good job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was but considering it was in Germany, no good hamburgers. Right. Well, okay, one good hamburger, which was, came from a restaurant in a former toilet. But other than that, no good huh. hamburgers. You know, you can make a good hamburger almost anywhere, so I believe it. I want to know, does this yeah. mean you cook more now? It do, I really do cook more. Um, uh, having access to both Dutch groceries, they have a lot of English kind of analog stuff in the Netherlands because mm-hmm. I mean, because we kept our like royalty kept on dying like inbreeding or stupidity or whatever so we kept yeah. on importing other royalty like we imported some we imported William of Orange um, and so mm-hmm. a lot of English food is actually just Dutch food um, and then we imported um, the you know, German royal family and they brought some food over but it was weak and died um, so the Dutch and native English food overpowered the import of German food. Um, okay. But yeah, I cook a whole bunch. Um, and I, like, I, some of my favorite, I learn how to, or a best engineer, like my favorite dishes that you can't find anywhere else. So I can make a really decent Puerco Pudil, which is mind-blowing for somebody in Germany. Um, I can make um, fairly good Cuban food. I'm, oh, I just made my first over, ever homemade from scratch ramen the other day. Oh, nice. Oh. Yes. You and, you so, and Rick uh, that will have to thing. compare notes because Rick makes a lot to. of ramen There was this great guy in Berlin during the middle of the pandemic who started a, like a an underground ramen restaurant. Mm-hmm. So he was unlicensed. He was cooking it out of his house. Um, and you would go to his house, which is in a, a small residential neighborhood, and ring his doorbell. Like he would come to the second floor window and like lower down a red bucket <laughs> on a string. And he would put cash in it and it would go up and then it would come back down with like a little ramen kit. And you know, he was wildly <laughs> upset. Like he would, he's like, yes, this is 38% um, hydration homemade noodles. I'm like, I didn't really need to know the percentage, but good, that's great. And he fermented his own peppers for the layu and all this kind of stuff. Huh. So wow. when I left Berlin, I had to learn how to make tantam and ramen. 
Because yeah, in Western Germany, there is pretty, weirdly, pretty decent Japanese food because all of the Japanese um, Zayabatsis had their um, headquarters in Dusseldorf, which is about half an hour from mm. me. Um, and so there's mm-hmm. a little Japan town that's really good. You know, like Japanese are obsessed with French patisserie. Um, mm-hmm. And there's some really, really good little patisserie places there. Um, but the, the ramen place, which is Japanese owned and operated, is not as good as this weird, obsessive white dude hmm. lowering a red bucket out of his window. In <laughs> Who fucking knew? We had um, a bunch. During the pandemic, we had a bunch of places, um, not necessarily doing things out of their home, but they would do like, restaurants were closed, so they would take over the kitchens of restaurants and they would create right, right. Uh, family meals or they'd be like, this is the menu for the week and we're going to make this on Monday, this on Tuesday, this on Wednesday. And you literally just go to the door, you give them money, they hand you a bag and they leave. And that I'm sad that's not really happening. Like everyone's back in restaurants and stuff. And, and yeah. I'm, not, I'm not there. So we had that little bit in Berlin as well. For a very brief moment, like a shining three month period, there was a restaurant running out of a ghost kitchen called Tiffin. Mm-hmm. Which ghost is a couple kitchen. Of tech that's entre- the word I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah. A couple of tech entrepreneurs who had managed to beg their mothers for their favorite recipes. Like one was from Kashmir and um, one was from Gujarat. Um, and they would, they only did like two or three dishes a week and they would make a limited number of them. So you got on the mailing list and then they would show up. Um, and they took over this guy's failed, well, failing. It went on to later fail, um, um, non hybrid restaurant where you can get like, um, non fusion. So non bread with huh. like a cheeseburger mm-hmm. inside of it, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. sounds good, but really should be fired into the sea. It was just fucking <laughs> awful. It wasn't good. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but it had a fully equipped kitchen. So these, for the three month period, these guys did things like um, I had a butter chicken, which is not my favorite dish. Like I wouldn't pick butter chicken if I was going to go to a restaurant, but I hadn't had um, good South Asian food at that point for like four years. And I mm-hmm. cried while I was eating it. It was because I did the part of England where I grew up and also has a huge South Asian community. Like the Bradford Lead Circle has just huge numbers of Gujarat and Kashmiri restaurants. So it was genuinely delightful for me. And, and little bits and pieces like that, like some of them went on to become restaurants. So they did well right. enough that they ditched their old careers. There was um, a really good, like tiny patisserie place that just made um, like petty four versions of classic desserts, but like this big. So you could have like hmm. twelve desserts and you didn't have to pick. It's amazing. <laughs> um, and uh, like the the street food scene in like maybe ten percent of what Portland's was, which is weird because Portland Metro is like like Portland itself is only like half a million people. Portland Metro is like two and a half million people, something like that. Yeah, so that Berlin right? is forty times the size of the Portland Metro area, and it has like one tenth mm-hmm. of the street food scene. But they our tried. street food has exploded since you were last here, like. You could you could eat for years straight just by going to trucks and not have mm-hmm. to eat at the same truck twice. See that? And I remember that started out in like the two thousand like it started out in the two thousand early two thousand crash, then they yeah. doubled down again in the two thousand eight crash. So I guess people just like, oh, making food's just much nicer than working in tech, we're gonna stay doing that. Yeah. Very much yeah. so. And so I remember oh, when, like, the wait, pop- Portland just won more James Beard restaurants than any uh, oh, James saw, Beard awards than any other city. Mm-hmm. That's, That's yeah, right. I, Suck it, other is, cities. Portland is kind of awesome when it comes to food. I remember some, yeah. I, I mean, most of the places I knew when I was, I mean, it's like 20 years since I left now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, shocked if any of the places I was still alive. Yeah, like unfortunately, La, La, La Even Coretta Bistro just Montage. went under too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I saw closed, Montage, Montage closed. Montage closed. Yeah. yeah. Isn't, doesn't Montage have like a truck spinoff though? They do. Yeah. 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 But yeah, so no more like beautifully crafted foil swans littering the side of a road at no. 4 o'clock in there. <laughs> it's very sad. Yeah. Very, very sad. But um, yeah, I mean, I think one of my favorite places was right by my old office when we went to college and that was veritable quandary you remember oh, that place meet you. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep yeah it was delighted i think i dated at least five of the wait staff there at some point it was just like, <laughs> martin you dated everybody <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah probably at some point it gave you large numbers sorry about that portland 
Like it's <laughs> like the t-shirt should give you an idea about why that was a genuinely terrible idea for me to be dating anybody. Um, <laughs> but it's like I would take people to karaoke. That was fun. Karaoke was good. I will tell like you my, a story. My, my most successful oh. date ever. Can I tell you the story of my most successful I date ever? I swear this is my most successful date ever. I've been friends with this guy for years and years and years. His name is Martin. And we decided that we got along so well, it would only make sense for us to try to date. And so we decided that we would go out to dinner on a date to one of my favorite places, which is now closed. And we sat there at our tiny little table in this adorable French place with giant pianos and cards stuck to the ceiling. And it was the most awkward experience I've ever had. I went to the bathroom. I came back. We had a very brief discussion and decided that this was no longer a date. (laughs) And the rest of the evening was fantastic. And I swear to you, that is the best date I've ever had in my life. So if anyone wants to know what a perfect date is like. I wish (laughs) more of my dates had ended. (laughs) I really do. Um, um, So, yeah. um, Like, that was was really good, but we should... It wasn't the most memorable fake date, though. The most memorable fake date was the time I locked myself out of my house. At Christmas. On Christmas Eve. Yeah. Yeah. I was, um, all, all my housemates had gone away for, gone home for Christmas. They were mostly Southern and, uh, I lived way out. Um, and it was a really, it was an old, um, Methodist minister's Man- house. It was, it was mansion, beautiful. Enormous. It was a mansion. It was, hmm. Oh my God. Um, it was an amazing, um, up a, it was like way Burnside, right? Way up on Burnside. Yeah. So, yeah. and, and around it had grown up a neighborhood, which is the South, which is at least now called felony flats. Um, so it was a very out of character house there, and also like um, locksmiths did not serve that neighborhood, especially not on Christmas for, Eve. Yeah, for historical <laughs> reasons. So um, it was like, well, and the thing is, I also I kind of didn't like Christmas. Like it was not my holiday. I liked Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving was fun, mm-hmm. but I was like, oh, Christmas sucks. And now I can't even get into my house, which at any given point in my life is basically where I want to be. Like that whole, mm-hmm. you know go big or go home thing always greatly underestimate <laughs> always how much i home. really want to go home. go big <laughs> yeah. and go, home. Big go big yeah going home it. is big yeah so it's the worst holiday and i can't be the place i want to go in the world so it was, it was it was just lining up to be the worst instance of the worst holiday in recent years and it turned out not to be because i was like well who, who else do i know that's in town yeah tell me so like shall we just hang and we we just went around and did all the things that were open. So there was randomly a knife shop was open <laughs> um, on south on southwest Washington, um, where we managed to get lighters because we didn't <laughs> want to go in and buy knives like wander around with knives on Christmas because that just doesn't seem like a good idea. <laughs> but they sold things that they sold a whole bunch of stuff. They yeah, sold trophies. I think maybe we missed a trick there. Maybe we should have got each of the matching trophies. We should have got the trophies. I think that would have been a really um, good idea. There's still time. There's still time. Yeah, it's probably still there. I think it might be. I'll we'll find out. Yeah, I, I don't exactly. think they did a lot of business. I think it was a front or something. I'm pretty sure you're right. <laughs> it's a, you yeah. know, that kind of like, how is this? <laughs> Nobody ever goes in. I think we were the only people. Like, I worked Kitty Corner from that shop for years. I saw precisely zero people go in. We were the only people. What was it doing open on Christmas anyway? That's a great question. But I have no idea why. I I know why one of the places was open on Christmas because we went to. Did we go to Finnegan's, the toy store? Yes, we did. Yeah, I know why Finnegan's was open. It's a toy store. Where did we eat? That's the night we went to Jake's, and I had the most perfect uh, dirty dry Bombay martini. And I yeah. was wearing leather pants and looked like a rock star out on Christmas Eve. It was yeah, really great. Did. It was a great <laughs> evening for my ego. Yeah, I remember like later on, somebody like reports got back to me later from people that had seen us out, and you were described as like we saw Martin walking with somebody that looked like a cartoon rock star. Who was that? Cartoon <laughs> rock star. Yeah. Right here. 
That's like, the best when, for when, when randomly, like, rumors pass about and they get back to you later on, you know it's a pretty good thing. Yeah. So literally turned my um, – that was my turning point for Christmas. I now like Christmas. I have Christmas decorations. I have, like, a, a little Christmas tree that I've um, MacGyvered up so the cat won't kill it. Um, <laughs> So from I, I, 30 years of paying a holiday, it turned out to be okay. So, yeah, Tammy saved Christmas. And, <laughs> well done. And it was, in the, it was in the midst of a very difficult time for me for Christmas, too, because I was up in Portland, and the people that I was still around didn't care about Christmas. And, and I'm very much a, I have to make this great for everybody kind of person. But then everyone's like, all right, thanks for doing that. I'm going to go to the movies. And I'm like, oh. So it kind of saved Christmas for me, too. It is my favorite Christmas in memory. Sorry to oh, everyone else in my entire life, but it was my best Christmas. The next day was awful, yeah. but Christmas Eve was amazing. <laughs> and um, yeah, my mom won't watch this, so I can I can freely admit that that was my best Christmas ever. Like my mom goes hard <laughs> on Christmas. If she does like, watch it, she lives in it. I'm not sorry. I fixed him. He loves Christmas now. Just she lives thinking. in a church, so they have to like oversize everything for it to kind of fit. Mm-hmm. So they had for the longest time like a 16 foot Christmas tree that took like four days to put up and that kind of stuff. And my dad has a collection of animatronic, like hunting trophies mm-hmm. that are genuinely terrifying. Like what kind of like the moose head from uh, evil dead, you know, the one that's what yeah. I was, it's like, that's, yeah. I want to see them so I, bad. I try I sabotage that thing and it would come back to life every year. No matter how badly I I stabbed it, it turns out that the guy who went to the local fish and chip shop had bought like a pallet of the fucking things, and even my friend he would just give us a new one every year. I need to see this. A pallet of them because who would want this thing? Looked like it had been flayed. It had no fur. It was just like rubber skin. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, I no longer like think it's If Bruce Bolton had a pet moose, it would look like this. No, I'm not a fan of this. Yeah, that's but, not okay. Um, You've just ruined Christmas. Thanks. Uh, I feel like we've come full circle now. I feel like we have. All right, Rick, your turn. Weigh in. Ask a question. Get us back on track. Well, I'm wondering because, like, I feel like we need to have Martin back at some point anyway. So I wonder if we don't just, because this is exciting, like, if folks don't know, this whole (gasps) Deciding this is a season, Martin will officially be the last guest to answer our mildly interesting questions, and he's done his homework. So this could be a really compelling episode with the mildly interesting questions. So why don't why don't we get into that? I'm ready, and okay. I also just saw the time, so that makes sense. <laughs> oh my god! All right. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, I talk Mark? a bunch. Are you ready to be the last person to answer this set of mildly interesting? Well, except I'm ready. Rick answer it, but that doesn't count. Ready and kind of excited, yeah. Ready? Oh, I'm so excited. Okay. Question number one. What is your favorite but least useful hobby? Okay. This is a difficult one for me, and I've, I've been bouncing backwards and forwards on a couple of things. Um, one of them is um, cat pharmacology. Oh. So, yeah. So, um, in general, veterinary medicine in Germany is not super advanced. Okay. And they don't have, um, like, uh, uh, I don't even know what the English word for this anymore. It's too much speaking German. Apotheca. Um, pharmacists. They don't have pet pharmacy oh, as okay. a, really as a discipline. Um, okay. And so, and my cat is tiny. So, if I want her to have cat versions of appropriate medication, I kind of have to make them myself. So, like, she takes gabapentin for anxiety when she's traveling or when she's going to have a pet visit. But gabapentin only comes in 300 milligram capsules here because it's a human and it's, it's an epilepsy drug. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they say, oh, you just break it up and, like, put a spoon on her food. She'll eat that. I'm like, have you met cats? Are you fucking high? <laughs> of course you're <laughs> So I, I did all my research. I ordered from Korea because it's the only place you can get them. The tiniest size of gelatin capsule, the size five capsules, they're so, so small. In fact, I'm going to run and get one for a minute. Um, yes. And then um, I got a special set of tools for loading them up. Um, you're insane. A, a little I love drug this. scale. 
Um, so I could correctly dose her and I could titrate the dose for what would mm-hmm. give her exactly the amount of um, uh, relaxation without any sedatives. So these are my from South Korea. Look how tiny this capture No, wait, there we go. Oh, oh the my tiniest goodness. Thing. And then I took that in half with a scalpel. Um, and I have gray import greenies from North America because she likes catnip flavor the best. Mm-hmm. And I roll them into her. And every day she gets a greenie, whether there's a medication in it or not, to train her that greenies are good and she will always have a greenie. I'm pretty sure I'm on several transnational drug watch lists I because I assemble say. a drugs lab <laughs> in my house. But I have all of the evidence I need. The only controlled substances in my house are cat appropriate, and there's the cat. So, but that's not really useless. Like, it's only useful to me. Right. Sure. So I think the other one is But just, you know what? Uh, you, Hugely useful in an apocalypse scenario. Just saying. Which does lead into a further question later on. It but does. We'll just, we won't for, we're foreshadowing. So I think ukulele playing is my favorite useless one because I don't see people ever. Like, I talk a lot, but I'm, I'm when I j- joke about being a hermit, I really am a hermit. I really don't like yeah. going out or talking to people. So I never play for anybody else. I do karaoke in front of thousands of people, but nobody ever hears me play ukulele. It's hmm. just for me, and I love it. So there you go. Nice. I Interesting. Accept, I accept these answers. Drugs and or music. Drugs and or music. Okay. Question number no two. No sex, but drugs and rock and roll. <laughs> there you go. Two out of three ain't bad. All right. Okay. Question number two. Would you like to survive the zombie apocalypse? So this answer has recently changed in the last couple okay. of years. I would have been, when I was younger and we knew each other, I would have been firmly yes. Yeah. Spent a whole bunch of time thinking about it and planning out. Um, and it's it, now it's gone from a firm yes to a maybe. It depends on the circumstances at the time. I kind of want to survive the zombie apocalypse only to watch all of the billionaires who have built all these bunkers in New Zealand get kicked out by their own security guards when they realize that the enemy is my billionaires <laughs> because of society. Like society mm-hmm. is the thing that it's the enabling technology for them being rich assholes. I kind mm-hmm. of want to stick around for that, but I realize they're not going to broadcast their own downfall. So there'd be no joy for it in there. I know it's going to happen. Um, and um, I don't want to have to worry about my cat. So no, um, I'm going to I'm gonna take us both out in the first few days. And they're quietly uh-huh. and peacefully. Okay. And I can make the drugs for it. Yes, you can. <laughs> Also, yes, my first, I, I trained as an industrial chemist at the Warren University for huh. so that, yeah, that knowledge finally comes in handy. Huh. I feel like we should have mentioned that. I knew that. And I feel like we should have mentioned that when we were talking about the drug. We mixing, can save but... that for the next episode where we talk about how I accidentally sterilized myself making candy. Fantastic. Let's do that. Okay. Uh, question three. What? <laughs> I think we've broken the rip. <laughs> <laughs> Question number three. Are you okay, Rick? Yeah, I'm fine. (laughs) This is exactly what I needed today. Question number three. What is the last food that you photographed? Tang Tang Men Ramen. Yes. Which I finally made. I kind of fucked up my garnish game. Um, So that was a little bit shameful because I had to send a photo to my friend Dave who lives in Osaka and Hmm. um, his wife who I've been exchanging food with and like food gifts and cooking tips for years and years and years. And who I've, I've never met. Like I would send um, her pickles through day because I could make Japanese pickles at home mm-hmm. um, and she missed them. Um, and she would send cakes back. Um, but yeah, so I, I realized that I needed to make it and it turns out to be surprisingly easy. It looked like a crime scene. <laughs> um, All that red. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I overdid the lot you. And the mince pork looked like I put a badger through a wood chipper, but it tasted good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you folks the photo later, but I'm not going to show it here because it's just too shameful. Yeah. I understand. Um, what is the best season? Used to be fall, now it's winter. Been winter for about 20 years, you know. Huh. I accept. And finally, magnets or stickers? Stickers. Yes. Magnets. I'm, I flatter myself that I'm fairly smart. Um, I've been told it for years and years, so I figured it's probably true. I don't know how magnets fucking work. I mean, they frighten me. It's Stickers magic. Are really obvious. It's yeah. magic. 
Magnets are magic. All right. I gave myself permission to cry during this episode when, when, and I'm going to tell you this, and I think this is going to mean something to you way back when I was like, we should have Martin on the show at some point. Um, the booking of you in this particular slot was Rick's request. Um, and I said, yes, that's fine. As long as I have a free pass to cry as much as I want to while we <laughs> talk to him. I haven't cried yet, but I'm feeling it now. So we should wrap up so that I don't. So you should wrap, you should wrap up the no, show. What I'm Let's saying, see if we can get you to break. No, what no. I want, what I want is for Rick to wrap the show up. Rick, oh, you haven't well, known Martin nearly as long as I have. That's out of but, character. But you know how much Martin means to me and how much I mean to Martin. Mm -hmm. You had to have the super uncomfortable meet Martin for approval moment. In, in <laughs> it's true. You wrap up the show. You did and, great. And, you did great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you did. Um, <laughs> wrap up the show, but leave us room for a sequel. Okay. Um yeah, where even to begin? There are people I know that have been part of Cammy's life at some point in time that she greatly values and, uh, you know, references or, or talks about or, or kind of shares history. But there is no single person that I have felt more positively impacted Cammy's life as a young woman in in her for, most probably formative stages as as Martin has and i i can only assume that cammy had a similar impact on martin i haven't had as much time to spend with him but the beauty of their relationship and the to the point of picking back up just like it was yesterday i've seen it happen time and time again i know that there's distance and there's time that separate both of them but Martin is one of those wildly interesting people in our universe that I'm really glad that we're able to get the chance to chat with and to share with you. So we are absolutely looking forward to having Martin back. Uh, you know, we may have to close every season. I don't know what we're going to do, but we, we, oh, I know what need, we need. Martin is Martin our AI correspondent. Like he needs Martin, a chorus. He needs a correspondent be... role. Will you be our official AI correspondent, our senior no, AI correspondent? I will be your stochastic <laughs> parrot correspondent. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Accept. Accept yes, it. I will. Um, and just to foreshadow the next time you have me on, just so you hurry up back and have me on, because A, fuck you, Rick, you made me cry. Um, but I, <laughs> there's one thing I want to tell you about, and we didn't talk about this time. So for next time, I want to tell you about pandemic pizza. But we'll just leave okay. that there. Mm, I almost God. asked a bunch of pandemic questions, but didn't. So I'm super excited for part two. We can make next from the pandemic special. I love it. All right. Thank Thanks you, for having me on, folks. It was amazing, yeah. even though I cried into my cocktail. <laughs> All right. Let's say still hang out for a little bit, but let's say goodbye to everybody. Thank you for joining us. Bye. And we will... See you again next season on Mildly Thanks Interesting. Thanks for listening to My people. Ridiculous Nonsense with these two wonderful people. <laughs>